we came to talk about books and kick ass. We're all out of books. Do you wanna be a fascist illiterate? Do you want a nation under fucking aliens? Welcome to Bad Adaptations. Today, for our November edition, we'll be talking about the 1963 science fiction short story, 8 o'clock in the morning, as well as the film adaptation from 1988, They Live. So we had decided that we were going to do this as our November edition, but then Green Day helped us out <laughs> by releasing a video inspired by They Live. Let freedom ring with all the crazies on the short story and it is quite short. Short enough that you can actually pause this video, go look up 8 o'clock in the morning, and read it and come back in like five minutes. In 1963, Ray Nelson wrote 8 o'clock in the morning. Actually, I had never heard of Ray Nelson before, but apparently um, the story 8 o'clock in the morning is his most famous work, other than his time travel one, which is like William Blake traveling into the future or something. Great Scott! Yeah, and I guess he's also known for creating the twirly beanie. And unlike the film, the character's name is George Nada. And there's no uh, plot with glasses or vision or anything. Rather, the uh, entire world's been hypnotized. And this Nada wakes up in the middle of the hypnotism, and the rest of the world is kind of still hypnotized. So he can see things that all the other people can't. We don't have a Frank, so we don't have that very sweet story of friendship. Um, and we really don't have the um, kind of uh, wanderer's nomad camp that's kind of off to the side that's central in the movie. Instead, we really just have Nada going around trying to convince people of what he actually sees. They're reptilian people in mm -hmm. the short story rather than creepy alien people. Um, and instead of Holly, we have his girlfriend Lily. And then in 1986, this short story was adapted by the author and comic book artist Bill Ray to, uh, into a kind of graphic form, and this is basically a direct overlay of the short story. <clears throat> Some interesting things to think about with this, though, is that um, Lily in this comic book is depicted in this very kind of disturbingly graphically sexual way. Um, the reptilians are very different from what we see in the Carpenter adaptation. And uh, in the end, uh, Nada does die, but he dies from uh, being cued to have a heart attack. So he's able to infiltrate the new studio, like in the film, uh, and he's able to get people to kind of wake up to what's going on by mimic mimicking the voice of one of these reptilian creatures. And uh, the ending is basically, he did not get to see the revolution because he died of a heart attack. So. Yeah. And so that's actually where the title of the short story comes in, is when he was um, sort of suspected by the uh, alien, reptilian alien government, they called him up um, and told him, even though he was aware, they told him, you will die at 8 o'clock in the morning of a heart attack. Um, and then despite having been woken and waking up the rest of the U.S., he still ends up dying. So it's kind of a more, um, I don't know, creepy or for like foreboding ending. So the 1988 film They Live is a John Carpenter film. He directed and wrote the music and it's a cult classic uh, for sure and this is something that's true of I guess many John Carpenter yeah. films. So we have um, Roddy Piper mm -hmm. who's a Canadian wrestler yeah. I believe. Roddy Rowdy Piper. Do exactly what I want to do. You say I'm insane? I say thank you very much! Frank is played by Keith David, and Holly is played by Meg Foster. They're sending some kind of signals on the TV sets. Um, and so in the film we have John Nada. <laughs> So, George to John, but he's actually never named until the final credit. Um, he has been recently unemployed and he goes to find a job. He ends up at a work site um, where he meets this man, this black man named Frank, who is basically the only one who's trying to help Nada out. Yeah, and the name Frank Armitage is actually the name that John Carpenter wrote 
the screenplay under. So you don't know, like, is he filling in? Like, is this where John Crawford sees himself yeah. in the movie? And he tells them about this shelter where um, Nada can sleep for the night, get food. So at the shelter, we um, see this scene where a TV is supposedly malfunctioned. It's used. Just... Our impulses are being redirected. We are living in an artificially induced state of consciousness that resembles sleep. People still don't catch on that this is reality. They think it's just some kind of hoax. Understand, they are safe as long as they are not discovered. That is their primary method of survival. Keep us asleep, keep us selfish, keep us sedated. They're pulling the water out of the sand like sponges. Blow it out your ass. Nada ends up going to this church um, and finding these sunglasses and he sees that um, there's some kind of secret cult congregation type group um, and they're talking about what we find out to be is this alien insurrection. So anyways they get taken down by the police and um, they, then this is how we're left with <laughs> Nada somehow changing everything um and he goes back to the church finds the glasses puts one on um sort of not knowing what it is and he starts walking on the street and realizes that there are these um signs everywhere saying like consume marry and reproduce so what before was you know adverts of like sexy women and um, newspapers and magazine articles he finds out are these subliminal messages from the alien overlords. <laughs> so he um, ends up getting a gun um, <laughs> and killing a lot of aliens. Um, along the way um, Nada has met this lady named Holly who works at the TV station. Frank and Nada, they end up running up to the signal. Um, Holly, spoiler alert, is a mole, a terrible lady who kills Frank um, and is about to kill Nada, but he kills her first and then he cuts the signal. He dies up there, so that's like the story mm -hmm. where he doesn't get to see the revolution. But then we see that normal human beings in bars and in their homes see the aliens for what they are. And we end on this sort of black comedy note where a woman is having sex and she's watching the TV. She sees an alien on the TV. She looks up. She's very confused. She looks down and realizes the man she's fucking is an alien. Which is a direct uh, overlay from the 1986 comic. Um, so it's interesting to see the things that do get taken out and the things that, that were definitely not in there. Right. Yeah. So in a way, we're also having an adaptation of an adaptation. There are no <laughs> limits. We it must figures it would be something like this. Uh, so 8 o'clock in the morning is actually going to be a direct adaptation. Uh, I think it started in 2011, there was oh. talks of this. that So Carpenter intentionally said, you know, this is an adaptation, but a very loose adaptation. Right. So there's a director now who's working to ad adapt the actual short story. Oh. So, story is quite different. It's very. Um, and again, in our last Frankenstein video, we here where um, a lot of the plot points um, end up sort of going to the same place mm -hmm. but um, I think this it's the nature of the genre we have a longer film versus a short story and the short story is a very distinct genre um, where you have to keep everything very condensed and in fact short stories I love them because they keep open a lot of mystery and so I think the film has to necessarily expand um, and so they fill in a lot of the details, and they, um, Carpenter obviously makes up a lot of new things to sort of um, make his film more complex. Mm -hmm. um, but that ends up making them two very different pieces of work. Yeah, it's funny though. So the one thing that we don't see with a lot of our adaptations that we've talked about is tone. Um, mm -hmm. Usually the tone tends to change. I felt like the short story had this very like Hemingway-esque... Hemingway?
He was an abusive alcoholic misogynist who squandered half his life hanging around Picasso trying to nail his leftovers. Yeah. Almost where it kind of read like fan fiction. Yes. Um, and you the, can tell it was like written for a magazine. Yeah. So like one of those very popular science fiction magazines. Yeah. You can tell it was written for something like that. Yeah. It feels like a movie, but it feels like a movie that's not trying to be like a big budget Hollywood. It's, Certainly. Yeah. yeah. So it almost, it maintains that like minimalist tone of just that's being like. That's true. It's almost like it's trying to communicate its like performative masculinity through both like the short story and the movie itself. Yeah. Well, especially because we see not and Frank is like very simple men mm -hmm. that just follow the rules and then you know come across this conspiracy where they can no longer follow the rules. Yeah, they're portrayed as these you know don't talk much, just work. Yeah. Um, there's little. There's not a lot of dialogue. No, there isn't. That's that's true. Yeah. Um, and a lot of it's through the physicality of the film. <laughs> I don't want to fight you. Come on. I don't want to fight you. Stop it. No. I guess we could just talk about embodiment with these characters, right? So, right, we have things like race and gender. Um, we even have the way that, so the theme of vision and eyes. Yes. Holly's eyes are intentionally bright up. blue. Yeah, they're very funky. Back to like Blade Runner. glowed her eyes are so different than everybody else's yeah. it's kind of like cues you in the second time you watch the film yeah. you're like oh she is the bad person yeah. she's blonde she's in corporate clothing she's got like red lipstick mm -hmm. um she looks very prim and proper and she's got those piercing blue eyes so roddy piper's character nada is in this like um blue and green washed um very worn plaid you know blue jeans Interesting is these men all have very like they're not this like the skinny but muscular they're very wrestler type builds and yeah. you can see that um, and like they're very yeah. manual worker yeah. looking like they look like what real manual workers mm -hmm. would look like a lot of um, fans of this film are actually like libertarians and neo Nazis which is so bizarre. Because John Carpenter has had to publicly announce, this is not a film for you. But it, it just, it seems like it's a willful mis misreading to say that this is on behalf of, I don't know, what now are like Trump supporters yeah. or neo-Nazis. Um, yeah. I think the film is a little bit more complex and not as shitty. It's an important film to talk about, and we need to talk about it thoughtfully because it, it is one of those films that you can easily misinterpret. As it is so, so scarce in terms of dialogue, mm -hmm. um, the character is kind of. Nada is Bella Swan from Twilight. Blowing the rain? <laughs> what? You're asking me about the weather? Yeah, I, I guess I am. I don't really like the rain. Like, he is he is a blank slate, and you can project as much as you want onto him. Like, it's he's, he, there's not a lot, we know nothing about him, so you can right. be like, this is me, like, I, I am Nada. Um, and so that makes it kind of this, this space for yeah. your own kind of malicious, awful interpretation. Yeah. So there are some, like, problematic elements, right? The idea of significant amounts of violence in order to solve problems. Um, and you can see where some of the like more um, not even unsavory, just plain awful um, mm -hmm. kind of subgroups in culture would take from this, right? So the short story, the comic book, and the movie all are based on the idea that you have to go murder the shit yeah. out of the bad people. Yeah. Um, and so you kind of dehumanize and other these bad people by making them alien. In like in America, where mass shootings are totally normalized now, yeah, that that I think that's the thing in the movie that gives me the biggest pause is just like yeah. the quick jump to pretty right. awful violence um, in in the short story, comic book, and film. On the other hand, we also see that the secondary bad guys, who are almost as bad, if not worse, are the rich elite. Mm -hmm. So this is where I think the the analogy to um, I don't know. Uh, 
libertarian notions of utopia, I think that's where it breaks down, is because the rich elite are complicit. But I think this is where the film really sort of stakes its claim that Carpenter is looking to stage a revolution on the behalf of um, the di disenfranchised and the oppressed. Just listen to John Carpenter, yeah. who made the film. In some ways, intentionality is really important. Yeah. And he did not make this film to be a neo-Nazi wank fest. <laughs> it is important because we don't just watch films to escape from current situations, right? A lot of science fiction extrapolates to start, like some extrapolate more than others, some are more true to our reality. Um, but a lot of science fiction deals with contemporary problems. So I think it is important to talk about the reception and how people are talking about the film, whether you know it's, it's in ways that we think um, actually make sense or ways that are um, completely off base. 63 and 80, 86 and 88, uh -huh. um, right? Cold War. Right, uh, yeah. So the idea of aliens is significantly more um, entertaining and something that's so pressing, right? You have these you have these potential, like, Russians up in the sky spying on the American people and are we right. going to be nuked by Cuba? And, like, what's, yeah. what's going to happen? So it's all these, like, external forces that are trying to get us and it's not our own like internal political climate right. it's the others and so yeah. that makes the alien this really great vehicle to communicate through yeah i could see this film easily remade today with sort of the um allegories to our current mm -hmm. political situation uh, our our main people are just a, a, a literal a literal wrestler yeah <laughs> a literal, like a macho man to the extreme like pick any stereotype like boxer, wrestler, whatever, like, that's him. Um, so we don't get any complex female characters, definitely no complex female characters of color, um, LGBT characters, not explicitly. We're going to talk about with the unnamed narrator, he's supposed to be our every man. Yeah, again, our Bella Swan. Like, Empire. Like, projection. And you wonder, because of the absence of all the characters that Amy just named, does that make it a richer text for people to force their really awful interpretations right. onto? I don't think it would be as easy yeah. to force neoliberal, neo-Nazi, fascist readings onto this film if you had a little bit more representation. Um, sort of a less politically uh, controversial point are the awesome lines of this film. You, you're okay. This one, real fucking ugly. Oh. You see, I take these glasses off, she looks like a regular person, doesn't she, huh? Put them back on, formaldehyde face, that's what that's we got. That's enough out of you. The movie is infinitely quotable, and it's actually, there are points where it's more saturated in pop culture than the film actually is, so yeah. just these quotes, and the quotes are not anywhere in the short story. The short story right. is just like, this is what happened. This guy killed a bunch of people. The end. Yeah, so this is John Carpenter's genius. Yeah. Let's give a press conference and how to buy a sailboat as Gloria, time like, news. Like shit. I'm on What happened? That What's wrong? It's so over the top. I have come here to chew bubble gum and kick ass. And I'm all out of bubble gum. Oh, it's delivered in such like a wrestling Hulk Hogan. Yeah. Like, this is this is his wrestling training. Yeah. Basically coming through when he delivers these lines. Yeah, it's it's pretty hilarious. Like I know there's supposed to be like those moments of triumph or whatever. I just can't help but laugh. No. I'm pretty great. Life's a bitch. She's back in heat. So, what's your rating for this film? I think it's a good adaptation. Uh, I watched this movie in undergrad when I was going through my cool film girl stage. Um, so it has a special place in my heart. Uh, it was right up there with like all my Steve McQueen movies. So I'm never, I don't think like I'm ever gonna not like the film. Oddly enough, I didn't like the short story. Um, I think the film, uh, Roddy Piper gives such kind of a sweet, understated performance, even though he is, he is our Twilight Bella. Um, he still, he does it in such a way, and the relationship between him and Frank is very sweet, and I think that adds some human element to all of the mass murder going on in the film, and I think when it's read 
correctly with evidence and actual analytic insight rather than trying to force an agenda, it's it's a really good film. Um, and it does much better than the short story does. And of course it's a short story, it's shorter, it doesn't have as much time to develop, um, but it's still very kind of static and cardboard versus this one still slightly slightly lampish, um, but it's still there's still so much there, um, and I think it is the characters, it's, it's Roddy Piper um, that really kind of makes this film so iconic. If you can replace a character, specifically a female character, with a lamp, you're not doing well. <laughs> yeah, so, um, I, this film is complicated for me because I'm used to reading like science fiction short stories, so in some way I'm inclined to say that I like the story more. I love the ending of the story, um, but I also think the ending of the film is kind of funny, yeah. tongue in cheek. I think I still prefer the story. Last time we talked about how the horror film in some ways has um, eclipsed the novel, and I really disliked that because I love the novel. In this case, I like the story, um, but I think the film is rightly so more iconic mm -hmm. than the story um, and I think actually the film's presence makes people go back and read the story yeah um, so I, I'm gonna say it's a good ad adaptation in that case because it enriches the story in a way that you know it might not get a lot of airtime or reading time <laughs> I don't know what the equivalent um, metaphor or yeah. idiom is for that um, but it actually makes me go back and read the short story. So the film is important in that way. Um, and I just also think it, I think it's well shot. Like it's a good film, despite how funny those fight sequences are. Like actually they're, they're fairly well, yeah. you know, like the cinematography is not bad. Yeah. Um, and I think like the costuming is on point mm -hmm. for the story that they're trying to tell. Um, the soundtrack's pretty great. Mm -hmm. um, even with all the misgivings of um, sort of bad interpretations, I think the film can stand to help people talk about difficult issues, um, whether it's you're going to be talking about it in an alien form or actually getting to the core of the issue, which is what humans do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, good adaptation. Yeah, good adaptation. Definitely good adaptation. Definitely watch it. Watch it with an actual analytic framework. Yeah. Um, don't watch it if you're a neo-Nazi. Just don't be a neo-Nazi. Like, yes. that's our advice for you today, for anybody <laughs> yeah. watching this. Yeah, don't yeah. be a neo-Nazi. No, not a good thing. Always, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed our video, give it a thumbs up. Um, please subscribe to our channel. We put out um, a large video like this every month. Um, we're thinking about maybe doing short videos if anyone's interested certainly let us know in the comments because otherwise we won't know if that's a good idea or not yeah. um, you know share with your friends uh, check out our Facebook our Instagram I'm really bad at updating that Stephanie is a lot better with the Twitter so check that out lots of cats so many cats <laughs> all the cats even cool if cats. you don't like us just come for the cats thanks for watching and we look forward to any of your comments Illuminati. <laughs> <laughs>